Now it's time to hear the stories of Utes in their own words. This is Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Here's your host, Mike Legeschult. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. I'm Mike Lagashell. Thanks for joining us. Well, this is our third show coming up already. We've had a chance to catch up with Donnie Daniels, a former assistant coach and the current director of player development at Utah. He looked back at the 1998 Final Four run by uh, just a, a very special Utah men's basketball team that got us started. And then in issue two, Christina Basquette, a former national champion gymnast at the U who is now a Hollywood stunt performer. She dropped by for a great long interview. You can find all of those on YouTube, Spotify, and YouTube. And time now to turn our attention to a little college football. Um, we started doing these shows during the coronavirus shutdown. We're now about eight weeks in, and you know, a lot of the talk has been about sports whether they were winter sports or spring sports that were interrupted or really didn't get off the ground. And, you know, another sport that's been majorly impacted is, has been college football as well as, you know, soccer and volleyball and some of those other fall sports. But really college football, when you think about it, it's so important to just sort of the spirit of a campus. And financially, it's huge to uh, especially Power 5 programs, but really every campus that has football, um, the financial impacts that this season does not start on time could be tremendous. And if it does start, how how, what's the quality of the football going to look like? And we thought this would be a good chance to uh, provide some insight on that. Uh, last Friday, we did uh, an Inside the Headset feature for Utah season ticket holders that featured defensive coordinator Morgan Scally, who was down his 13th year in the program, and Morgan being a former Utah player, uh, current coach. He's uh, been around the program for a long time, obviously. He had some great insight to provide to us, and so we thought, what well, better way to give you some football to think about and talk about would be to present this interview one more time. So, again, we record this interview last Friday. Morgan Scally joining us for an Inside the Headset feature feature on YouTube and here it is once again on Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Back with that in just a moment. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah Athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Now back to more of Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. Everyone I talked to has just been blown away by how the past, you know, eight weeks or so has has played out. I mean you think about it, it's it's you know middle of March and you guys, you know, the guys are away for spring break, you had a little bit of a break. In your spring football schedule, you had a weekend. Guys are away. They're ready to come back. And all of a sudden, on a Friday, we hear from the Pac-12, we're shutting down everything indefinitely. And at that point, we don't know, is it going to be a few weeks? Is it a month? How long is this going to last? And here we are. It's it's almost middle of May. And uh, Morgan, you and I are at home for a reason today. We can't really go in and do anything. And it's just been such a unique situation for all of us. So I guess, Morgan, in terms of you as a football coach, trying to stay in contact with your guys, trying to get prepared for a season that at this point we think will happen. What's your, what's your schedule been like the past couple of months? Well, it's obviously been flipped around. This is a time where we would be out on the road recruiting. April 15th through May 31st is our biggest recruiting period of the year. So we would normally be out on the road visiting high schools, speaking with high school coaches about their prospects. Uh, obviously, that's not happening. So, you know, the NCAA's come in and, uh, you know, done a great job of at least giving us uh, some, some rules and some guidelines to go by. We've got eight hours a week that we can meet with our players uh, via Zoom uh, or Google Classroom, what, whatever it is. And so we're taking advantage of this time really to get our, our guys schooled up on scheme. We only had three spring practices that we got under our belt. So uh, a lot of the stuff that we had planned to install and to go over with our guys, we didn't get around to doing it. So that's kind of what we're doing right now is, is continuing the install and continuing to quiz our guys on, uh, you know, ultimately what they're going to be responsible for knowing once they get on the field. That's got to be, uh, I'm guessing, obviously frustrating for you as a coach, but yet everyone's in the same situation. But for you in particular, this year, you only have two starters back from last year. So there's a lot to install. I mean, you've been in the system, been in this program for a long time. So it's not as though you're a first-year head coach starting from scratch, but still, you know, for you as a defensive coordinator, knowing we had some work to do this spring that didn't happen, uh, what's your stress level been like uh, the past couple of months having to sit around when normally you could be getting some work done? Yeah, no different. I mean, the good thing, Mike, is that you you, ought, you get to practice what you preach, right? Yeah. And what you teach your players is control what you can control. Uh, does no good whining or complaining about, you know, the situation. It is what it is. We have to adapt. We have to get creative. We have to find 
ways to, to teach that we haven't had before. And so, um, you know, I definitely believe that this time and the obstacle that's in front of us has really allowed us to become better teachers, focus on ways to get information to our players that, that you know, we haven't used before. And a lot of the ways that we're doing it, we're finding are maybe more efficient and better than, than what we've done in the past. So uh, this has allowed us to grow and get better. Um, in terms of the, the inexperience, obviously, there's, there's uh, you know, stuff that you'd like to do on the field with them. Uh, but at the same time, you know, everyone's facing that same challenge. Uh, and so it's, it's going to be very apparent once we get back to campus, who took this time seriously, who found ways to uh, innovate and get better, and who kind of just stayed the status quo and, and really didn't, you know, uh, just sat at home and really didn't do anything. Yeah. Well, for those of you, again, joining us on uh, YouTube, the chat feature is on, so please send us your questions. I got a couple pop me up, and I'll uh, do some more of my questions with Morgan before we jump into those. We welcome you to Inside the Headset with Utah Defensive Coordinator Morgan Scali. This is the first one we've done, and again, it's just uh, sort of a thank you event for our season ticket holders who have been so great to uh, Utah football and Utah flags over the years. You know, Morgan, you were talking about just the challenges of, of Zoom meetings and not being able to talk to your guys in person. I know you especially as a coach, you're hands-on. You want to be around the guys. You want to have that personal connection that uh, has made you and, and Coach Witt, you know, so great at what you've done over the years. How are your guys doing? I mean, to be sent home to say, hey, we can't have group workouts. You can't have spring practice. You can't do a lot of things you've been doing. It's tough mentally. A lot of people have talked about Generation Z and how they're coping with this. And it's, you know, some have said it could be a while before they really fully uh, recover from this, this situation that's going to be continuing throughout you know, the summer, perhaps the fall, perhaps longer, we don't know. But how are you guys sort of mentally handling the situation uh, at this point? Well, I think the majority of them are doing a great job. And that's what you kind of try and recruit to your program or guys that are self-starters, right? You know, if, if, uh, if you have to rely on other people to get you going, just, just get used to mediocrity your entire life. And so – the biggest thing for us is recruiting guys that are competitive, that are self-starters, that when obstacles hit, they try and find a way um, to get better and improve uh, versus guys that sit there and point fingers and complain and, and, and woe is me. So the majority of our guys, I would say, you know, just because that's what we recruit to this organization, they're great. And uh, it's, it's incredible, you know, what a strong will can do. And we've got strong willed guys. Uh, we've got tough guys that we've recruited this program. They're smart. They're intelligent. You've got very good coaches on both sides of the ball, holding them accountable. And uh, as, as, as tired as my rear end is from sitting down and doing Zoom, <laughs> meetings, um, we're finding ways to get through it. And so uh, we love our boys. We're excited for the future. And uh, we just got to work every day. Well, Morgan, I thought it would be remiss uh, before we jumped into this year to not go back and talk about the NFL draft and some guys we had to unfortunately say goodbye to, but what a, a haul it was for Utah in terms of draft picks. Uh, Jalen Johnson, second round to the Bears. Julian Blackman, third round to Indianapolis. Terrell Burgess went third round to the LA Rams. Lucky Foto, fourth round to Arizona. Bradley and I, I thought he would go sooner, but he went finally fifth round to Dallas. And then, you know, John Penasini to the uh, – the Lions in the sixth round and also Zach Moss in that mix as well. Seven uh, guys from Utah went uh, six on the defensive side of the ball. That's the most for Utah taken in a single draft for the defense. And uh, that number by Utah led the Pat 12 tie for fifth most in the country. Again, seven guys going in the draft. Uh, Morgan, I guess uh, a few questions about those guys. First off, just your thoughts on, on what that means for your program and how happy you are for those guys who've done so much for Utah football. Well, two things. Number one is a credit to them for how they worked. Mm -hmm. We end up losing them really after the bowl game. And then from then on out, it's up to them, them and their agent. And uh, they're the ones that, that get themselves right. So credit to them for the way they worked, the way they interviewed, uh, the type of lives they lead. We are fortunate to have coached those guys. And it was a fun process for me because every phone call that I took from GMs, position coaches in the NFL, scouts, anytime they ever asked about any off the field stuff, you know, every single one of those guys was awesome and, and what, uh, and represented the University of Utah the right way. So that was fun 
to be able to speak to those GMs. I spoke to a defensive coordinator at the the LA Rams who uh, just said what a fan he was of our program, the way we do things. And so credit to our players, you know, it's all about the players and that's coach Whittingham deal. Um, And the second thing that I'm, I'm happy about is, you know, what it does is it shows that you develop your players. It's a credit to the coaching staff that coach Whittingham uh, has brought to the university of Utah, the way we teach, the way we uh, groom guys for that level. Um, So I'm, I'm happy. I've got a great group surrounding me. And, uh, and Kyle Whittingham, just the culture that, that he has in this program really allows guys to, to grow and to get ready for that next level. Yeah, seven guys, again, taken uh, from Utah in the NFL draft. That's the second most in program hif- history. We had eight taken back at 17. So, Morgan, my next question about those group of guys, you get drafted, you're so excited. Normally, you go to OTAs, you have all these things going on, you know, late April and the May that this year aren't happening the way they normally do. So, have you talked to you guys who are, are now trying to, to sell into that next level and how are they coping with this unique situation? Well, they're, they're dealing with what we're dealing with. They're mm-hmm. they're meetings now. <laughs> so <laughs> their install is going to be the exact same as, as what we're doing with our players. And it's, it's interesting. I've had phone calls with position coaches in the NFL, you know, how are you guys dealing with this? Um, so, you know, we, we do a lot of uh, developmental phone calls talking about best practices and ways to, to get our guys to learn. Um, and so I, you know, I, one of the interesting facts about this draft too, is, you know, when you, are looking at a prospect, right? You're looking at all aspects of who they are, how they learn. And so I think a lot of it is, you know, here we are in this situation. Um, Do we have guys with the intellect that, you know, we can sit here on a Zoom meeting and they can process what we're going over and they can pick it up without having to be on the field? You know, that's going to be a big deal for teams, uh, particularly this year with their young guys is, do we have that type of athlete that is able to, to sit here in a meeting, not get lulled to sleep, be able to take notes and do things the right way so that when we hit the ground running, it, we don't have to start all over again? Right. All right, Morgan, some questions rolling in. Let's get to these. Uh, again, thanks to Morgan Scala, Utah defensive coordinator in his 13th year with the programs of coach joining us on this Friday for Inside the Headset. And Morgan, our first question uh, coming, uh, asking about tell us. Or tell us about the Kafusi kid that joined us from Provo. What can you tell us about him? Well, um, I tell you what, there's not much we can say right now because uh, he's not in school. So right. I kind of just got to stay away from that one. Um, and we'll so- let it go with that. that I, I thought that might be the case, but you know the rules obviously better than I do on those. But I appreciate the interest. That's uh, obviously a big name when it comes to football, uh, Kafusi. So glad to have another one uh, in the family. Another question, Mark. Uh, this is coming from Jake to Spain, one of your old classmates from MBA school, checking in with. <laughs> he says, uh, thinking back a little bit in the past, he said, "What what are some of your favorite moments from playing for Utah back in the two thousands?" Uh, my, my favorite moments were always the stuff that, that uh, maybe not even show up on the field. Just the time that you spend with your teammates, um, you know, the joking around, the pranks that you play. I'll never forget, you know, Dave Revel was, is a good friend of mine, continues to be a good friend of mine. Um, and uh, I remember, you know, whenever we had an interview request from a media outlet, Um, Liz Abel, our sports information director, she would have those taped to our lockers so that when we came uh, back from practice, we would know if we were to be uh, interviewed. So what I did is I typed one up myself for Dave Revel (laughs) to call in at 1280 The Zone. And uh, anyway, he he called in unannounced. (laughs) (laughs) And I had a bunch of the guys, uh, you know, get on the radio to listen. (laughs) Uh, anyway, he called in during a time where I think a BYU tight end coach was supposed to be on. I guess it was a regularly scheduled deal for him. Okay. He was late coming out of practice. And so he said, well, the BYU coach isn't here, but uh, we got Dave Revel. (laughs) How you doing? And they interviewed him for about five minutes before they had to let him go. (laughs) And and, uh, I called him and I said, Dave, hey, dude, great interview. That was awesome. (laughs) He said, are you sure? 
because it was weird. It was like they weren't even expecting. <laughs> and I started laughing, and he was so mad. <laughs> so it's it's times like that that you have with your teammates that you never forget. And we had some special times, obviously being the first uh, non BCS team to, to bust the BCS playing the Fiesta bowl, never forget that, you know, and uh, really paved the way for that 2008 team to do what they did. And, uh, and then on into the pac 12. So um, just love this program and, and uh, love the times that I've, I've had, not only as a, as a player and a coach, but as a fan when I was growing up. That's well said, Morgan. I know your leadership was huge on that 04 team. And I think you said it right there. Without 04, there is no 08 Sugar Bowl. There is maybe no Pac-12. I mean, that 04 season really was a pivotal moment for the football program and for Utah Athletics and uh, for you to be so integral in that and and still around. It's great to have you still on campus and still uh, doing the deal every day with the Utes. Uh, another question along those lines, again, from Jake to Spain saying, Hey, now that you're in the coaching about 15 years, maybe some lessons you've learned uh, from your young players about now coaching this current generation. Oh man, I tell you what, they got to be a lot more headstrong and resilient. They, they deal with much more um, criticism. I mean, you look at social media and how everyone's got a voice. Everyone's got an opinion on how you should do your job. And I can only imagine what it would have been like for me when I played, um, you know, you just, you make mistakes and your job is out there for everyone to see everyone to, to critique. And these are young men that, that are still growing and still um, trying to figure out who they are. And so, you know, the, the, the young men that you bring into your program, uh, what you, you're also having to do is develop them. Uh, you know, what we what we tell our guys is that your skill set doesn't matter much if you don't have a great mindset. And so right. that we're having to teach a lot more uh, with with our players in this generation is that mindset that you have to have to be successful at this level, that you can't worry about what people say, uh, that you've got to uh, really focus on how you manage your off time and what you look at and who you listen to. Those voices that you listen to, that you let into your life, um, they can be very damaging or they can be very uplifting. And you really got to focus on, on, on those that uplift and uh, continue to help you to get where you want to go. And going back again a little bit to your playing days before we move on, you know, to be in a situation where you play someplace, you work way through the program, you've been with Coach Witt uh, all the way back to your playing days. What benefits have you had from being in the program that long and some things you took from your playing days when you were, you know, in the position of a, of a player that's helped you be a better coach during your tenure at Utah? Well, I, the blessing is I've been under some unbelievable people, uh, you know, starting with Ron McBride and, and, you know, that 04 team doesn't happen without Ron McBride. I mean, a lot of those guys that were on that team, he recruited to the program. Right. Uh, and he was such a people person, right. And, and such an unbelievable recruiter, uh, you know, obviously Kyle Whittingham, Gary Anderson, Kalani Sitake, John Pease, you name it. There's been some great coaches at the University of Utah that I've been fortunate to, to learn from. Um, but, you know, I'd say throughout the culture at Utah has always been a tough minded culture that you're going to work for what you get. Nothing's ever going to be handed to you. Uh, we're not the flashy name when it comes to recruiting. But what people are starting to understand and what recruits are really starting to see is that um, we do it right. And not only do you leave this program a better football player, you leave this program a better person. And that's why, to me, the health uh, of a organization or the health of your program, you can tell a lot by how many players leave this place and come back uh, or leave it and give back. So you start looking at the walls in our facility and you see uh, a Paul Solia, you see an Eric Weddle, you see these players, Alex Smith, Steve Smith. Right. Um, Zane Beatles. And, and, you know, as much as we love our boosters and our donors and they've done unbelievable things for us, it's so great to see the players come back and give back. And that's what's special about Utah. Yeah, it's, it's been an incredible run by this program. You, you hit on the head. Ronnie Mack got this thing rolling before he came to campus. You know, Utah football was mediocre at best. He, he built the foundation. Urban Meyer had a wonderful two years. Coach Witt stayed around and then it's just rolled into what it is now. And, uh, 
uh, just it's been fun to watch the, the program really grow into what it is. It's it's been quite the ride uh, the past you know, 25 years or so for uh, the Utes, and you've been a, a big part of that. Uh, Morgan Scott Call, our deputy AD for external checking in, he said, hey, Morgan, thank you for joining us, and thanks to our season ticket holders. He has a question for you as well. Uh, last night, the NFL schedule for 2020 was announced, and they put some uh, disclaimers in saying, hey, we, we might not start on time. We're not sure. We might move weeks of the season to – Later in the year, but you know, I think for a lot of people, it was encouraging to see. Hey, everyone's planning on this possibly starting on time uh, with the NFL, and you know, for you as a football coach, how encouraging was it to see a major announcement like that from the sports world? It's it's encouraging. Um, you know, having said that, you know, obviously the health of the nation is the most important thing, and uh, obviously we don't have all the answers, but it is encouraging to see that people are forward thinking that they're they're um, they understand the importance of athletics um, in a lot of different ways, right? Uh, people want to rally around a team. They want to rally around a common uh, goal, right? And a common vision. So uh, I'm grateful for Mark Harlan, Kyle Whittingham and, and the crew that's working so hard uh, with the PAC 12, with the NCAA to put plans in place. And uh you know, people, people want to see football. They want to see sports and uh, they're going about it the right way with, with the health of our student athletes in mind. And, uh, you know, we're just doing everything we can to control what we can control. Visiting with Morgan Scal, Utah defensive coordinator on Inside the Headset. We appreciate you joining us. And if you want to send us a question, the chat feature is available on YouTube. Uh, so go ahead and do so. We'll go about 10 more minutes here with Morgan on this Friday afternoon. You know, Morgan, I'll get more into the this year's team and the personnel in a moment, but we kind of have been talking about the NFL schedule coming out, you know, how maybe this fall looks, how this summer looks. So at this point, no one knows if we're going to start on start on time, if we're delayed, what's going to happen in the fall, even this summer, it's up in the air. But for your 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 position as a football coach, you know, once you get the go ahead, hey, we're looking to start on time. What's it going to take for you and this coaching staff to get this team ready to play football? Uh, throughout the summer and then into the month of August? Well, number one, it's utilizing the time the NCAA gives us. You know, the NCAA has given us time to, to get our guys ready, to meet with them, and uh, we're not taking that time lightly. You know, as, as much time as I'm spending home with, with, with my kids, I'm sequestered here a lot to my, my office where I'm doing a lot of meetings with our, with our players, getting them right. Uh, the biggest thing is making sure that we utilize the meeting time Okay, to the best of our ability so that when we do hit the ground, it's more getting our guys in football shape. Okay. It's, it's, it's guys in California, guys in Texas, guys that are at sea level, getting them back to elevation, getting 10 pounds of weight on them with their, with their pads and getting them in football shape because that's the other thing. I mean, you, you focus on their health obviously first and making sure that we're, that we're healthy, that we're doing the right things. But a part of that too is making sure that they're, they're, you know, ready for collision football. Right. Uh, and that's a, that's a big deal that, that Doug Elisaya and that staff do, do a great job of getting our guys physically ready for competition. You know, you guys work all spring. You have a little bit of a break, and then there's summer conditioning that the guys do June, July, and then we get going, you know, big time in August with training camp. The, the time frame I've heard a lot is sort of six to eight weeks for – uh, a time frame to get college football players ready to go to play games at the first game scheduled for September 3rd against BYU. Um, the six to eight weeks sound like a good time frame for you. And, you know, as a coach, Morgan, you make your recommendations. What are you thinking in terms of how much time do your guys need on campus with you and this, uh, the strength and conditioning staff to get ready for the 2020 season? Yeah, the six to eight week mark is the one that we're that we're looking at uh, that we sound you know that sounds best to us. Obviously, um, you know, being young on the defensive side of the ball, you'd like you'd like to say well, let's, let's extend that a little bit. But yeah, bottom, bottom line is that's the time that we feel uh, comfortably feel we can get guys ready to go. Obviously, there's a lot of moving parts in football, um, and uh, you know, getting those guys to work together um, and. Uh, you know, do their job as a collective whole is a big assignment, but that's, you know, usually that six to eight week mark is, is what you've been given in the past. And that's what we feel comfortable with the, the four week. You know, if they give us four weeks, they give us two days, you know, we'll get, <laughs> we're going to do what we have to do. But bottom line is, um, you know, 
six to eight is is kind of what we've been looked, looking at. All right. Well, Morgan, let's get into the personnel a little bit before we let you go. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, just a couple starters back from that great defense a year ago that was second in the country in total defense, third in rushing defense, 10th against uh, the pass in terms of pass efficiency. A lot of guys, uh, six of them drafted uh, onto the NFL. But the, the, listen, the, the foundation's been built for a long time, but you and Coach Wood have always been able to plug in guys. Recruiting's gone well. So despite the fact you have just two starters back, how do you – since this this defense shaping up for 2020 well the good thing is we feel like we've recruited well uh to the to the program and we've got guys to work with now it's just a matter of developing them uh them using this time to really work on their fundamentals and technique whether it be in a park whether it be at the the local high school wherever it is that they can go uh that's what we're uh expecting them to do and so you know We've had to replace guys in the past, obviously not at this level, but there's always been, you know, year after year, well, how are they going to replace this guy? How are they going to replace that guy? That's our job as coaches. You know, we recruit, we develop, and, and, and we manage those players that we have. We're excited for a young, new secondary. Obviously, our entire secondary is going to be brand new uh, with, with what Coach Shaw has done with the corners in our program. We're excited with these young faces that we have. Uh, you know, Travis Broughton was a young guy that we, that we brought to the program from Oklahoma last year, uh, really had a solid first season. Aaron Lowe was another one of those freshmen that played special teams, but that has the speed, has the toughness. Uh, Bronson Boyd that we brought over from wide receiver, um, he's going to be in the mix in that corner spot. And then obviously Clark Phillips was a, was a highly recruited name that we were able to steal from Oklahoma and uh, that we're excited about. So um, Malone Mataele, there's another guy that's been behind, um, you know, our starters. And uh, and he's a guy that has done nothing but work his tail off. And so now kind of is it his time to shine. The safety position, you're looking at, you know, pretty much all, all newcomers outside of, you know, R.J. Hubert got some time against Washington, got some time in the championship game before he tore his ACL. You know, we're expecting a, a, a complete comeback from him. Uh, Vontae Davis is a guy that spent time yep. on the program. This is kind of his year to shine, you know, a lot like Terrell Burgess where Burgess was kind of sat and waiting his time. Now it's, now it's Vontae's time to step up. So, um, you know, that, and, and, you know, a lot of young guys that we recruited into the program, you're going to see a lot of true freshmen playing this year. And, uh, you know, Nate Ritchie, Kamo Ilatu, uh, or, or some of those guys at the safety position that you're probably going to see. And then uh, linebacker position, Devin Lloyd obviously uh, did a heck of a job last year, you know, uh, in, in replacing uh, Cody Barton. Uh, and uh, so Coach Swan, what an unbelievable addition he has been to our staff. What a great teacher, uh, very, ty- you know, tireless recruiter. Uh, we've got some, some young kids coming into the program, Junior Tafuna, Graham Faluna, and uh, Jeremy Mercer, three names that we recruited to the position that we're excited to develop and get in there. Uh, other than that, you know, we've got guys that have been in the program that, that again, Coach Swan's doing a great job developing. D line really is the only only place on the defense that has got returning guys that have played a lot, you know, had a lot of reps. You got the two interior guys with Hawati Pututau, Viani Muala. Um, you know, Pizza Tonga, who's accumulated a, a number of reps throughout the years. Uh, Samisi Lawaki is a name that everyone needs to pay attention to. That guy is going to be very special, and, and we're excited about his development. And then at the defensive end spot, Max Tupai, Mika Tafua, those guys have started games before, you know, and, and, and had a ton of success. And then the youngsters behind them, you know, Xavier Carlton was a big-time recruit. Um, out of, out of, out of uh, Juan Diego, uh, and then um, Van Fillinger out of Corner Canyon. So a couple local local kids, and then uh, you know we've got uh, Tyler Wiggis, uh, who's also a defensive end recruit. So we got a bunch of dudes. We're fine yep. for them. They, they're talented. Now we just got to get them ready. All right, should be fun to, to watch this group come together as we hopefully get towards fall and then get things started in September. <laughs> you know, Morgan, you talked a lot about new guys coming into the program. A question coming from Eric Anderson asking, how has recruiting changed in the guys you can get to and talk to uh, since you've had so many guys go in the draft in recent years and also back-to-back Pat 12 South tiles? I, I imagine that's helped recruiting for you and, and your staff. 
Night and day, night and day. Guys that we're having conversations with on a regular basis would not have given us the time of day, you know, when we were in the Mountain West Conference, uh, you know, for, for good or for bad. But, uh, you know, bottom line is it being in the Pac-12, having success in the Pac-12, beating the California schools on a regular basis, being competitive year after year, winning the South two years in a row and, and having NFL success or at least getting getting guys drafted. All that has really opened doors to conversations with players from all across the country uh, and allowing us to recruit how we, how we need to recruit to win in the PAC 12. Um, you know, another guy that I'm, I'm excited about that, that has really bided his time is a guy named Blake Keithy out of, uh, out of Texas. Everyone knows about Brant. Brant led the team and I think receptions last year and, and, and maybe even receiving yards, but his brother is a heck of a football player. That's just unfortunately been plagued with injury since he's been here but he's a guy that that we are so fired up about at the defensive end spot, and uh, just just doing everything we can, saying our prayers, crossing our fingers, <laughs> healthy, because he's he's one that that fans are really going to want to want to take a look at. Well, Morgan, before we let you go, uh, you are one of the one of the fortunate people on campus who gets to work with student athletes on a daily basis, and for our Crimson Club members and season ticket holders whose funds all go toward supporting athletics, supporting scholarships, and, and sort of the overall mission of of college athletics here, you're someone who gets to again work with athletes on a daily basis. Maybe just talk about you know some of the the, the guys you've worked with and you've seen up close the impact of a scholarship and support and some lives that's maybe changed. I mean, there's kids who come in here who are maybe first generation college students who will not be in college without the chance to play college football or sport. And you've had a chance to work with some guys, some have earned a scholarship over the course of their career. Maybe just tell us a story or two about some kids you've been in contact with in your time as a coach that really stand out to you as you look back. Well, one that comes to mind is, is, is it was a second round draft pick last year, Marquise Blair, Marquise Blair, you know, out of Worcester, Ohio, uh, by way of a junior college in Kansas. You know, he, this is a kid that never was on an honor roll growing up. You know, his mom worked two jobs. He and his brothers basically ra- raised each other. Um, and uh, what an unbelievable kid. Came to our program, developed the right way, um, and left our university, you know, three straight semesters on an honor roll. I remember calling his mom and just being, you know, Hey, he's on the honor roll again and her, her just crying over the phone um, and how much it meant to her to have her son, you know, have that type of success. And, and then, you know, Marquise was not a guy that would say a whole lot. You know, he, he spoke with his pads and his helmet. That's what, yep. that's what Marquise communicated. But, uh, you know, you get these text messages every once in a while that make you cry that, that really, you know, it's why you get into coaching. And uh, he just sent me a text. Uh, you know, a month ago, just saying, coach, just want you to know, I was, I've been thinking about things and reminiscing about Utah and I want, want you to know how much I appreciate you uh, and love you. And, and I mean, that's enough to bring a tough guy to tears and, and uh, that's what it's all about and appreciate, you know, our passionate fans who, who trust us to bring guys into the program that are going to represent the program the right way with 120 to 130 guys, we understand that not everyone's going to be an angel, uh, that we're going to have our, our, our bumps and learning mistakes along the way, but we're doing everything we can to bring young men into the program that are going to represent the you the right way. They're going to do it the right way. And, uh, man, I I'm so, we are blessed. The entire coaching staff speaking for the coaching staff as a whole to work with these young men and they have the opportunity to have an influence in their lives at such a critical age. Well said, Morgan. Uh, you know, you said earlier, I'll second that, you know, the focus is about health. It's about safety. And that's why we're all working from home the way you and I are doing this this afternoon instead of being in person someplace, but to, to hear stories about, you know, what you do on a daily basis and hear stories about Marquise Blair and, and some other guys, I think is something our fans need to hear that for them to realize, Hey, uh, the support is still important as now, now as much as ever. And, and we will play football again. I mean, that's the bottom line. At some point we will, whether it's September 3rd, whether it's later this year, who knows, but there will be college football again. We will have fans back at Rice Eccles stadium. And it's, it's good to hear some, uh, some encouraging words and some great memories uh, on a Friday afternoon to sort of get people, uh, you know, feeling good about things before they head out for the weekend. So, Morgan, we appreciate the time. I know you're busy as, as ever. I've talked to people and 
And they're like, boy, you, you guys must be just sitting around. I'm like, no, there's, there's as much work going on as ever. <laughs> Whether you're support staff planning for what could happen, what's going to happen. I know coaches are, are grinding away as much as ever. There's, there's doing it at home instead of at the football center, but I know you're busy and uh, to, to stop by and give us a half hour. We really appreciate it. Morgan, all the best to you and your family. Mike, appreciate you, brother. Same to you and yours. And uh, go Utes. Thanks for all you guys that support us. And uh, let's pack that stadium again. Sounds great, Morgan. Thank you very much. Stay connected by searching for Utah Athletics on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Now back to more Utes Insider, presented by Pepsi. Great to catch up with Utah defensive coordinator Morgan Scally. You know, he talks about so many things from his time here. I remember when Morgan played on that 04 Fiesta Bowl team and, and how Urban Meyer came in here and really changed uh, the the atmosphere around the Utah football pro- program. Ron and Brian, a great job to get this thing going. But when Urban came in, it was a different deal. And Morgan is one of the veterans on that team, took on a huge leadership position and, and really – was so integral in uh, just what that old four team was able to do as the first BCS Buster. He's been around ever since as uh, an assistant coach under Kyle Whittingham. And, and uh, he's been around a long time, done a great job with the defense and some great insight there from Morgan. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, you, you think about so many things related to this coronavirus shutdown. You think about students, you think about student athletes and how their lives have been uprooted and changed drastically. And to get some insight from Morgan on how the football staff is, is staying in touch with their guys, trying to prepare for, for a season without the benefit of a spring practice and, and uh, in-person workout sessions. They've got some major challenges they've been facing and will continue to face throughout the spring and summer. And uh, great uh, to hear from Morgan to get some some insight on how that's playing out. Uh, I know a lot of fans have had some questions about, you know, how's this all going to play out, what's happening right now. And, uh, you know, again, as of right now, we plan on starting the season September 3rd. It might not happen, but everyone's sort of gearing up for that date in case it does happen and uh, some great insight again from Morgan Scally, Utah's defensive coordinator. And again, all of our shows can be found at iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And that will do it for this edition of Utes Insider. Thanks again to Morgan Scally for dropping by. Until next time, I'm Mike Ligeschult. So long, everybody. This has been Utes Insider presented by Pepsi. To hear more episodes of this show and other Utah athletics podcasts, search for them on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube.